Well, if you'll turn to Hebrews, the latter part of chapter 6, and then we'll move into 7 this morning. The writer has been encouraging these immature believers to not stop where they are spiritually, but they are to press on to maturity. Our life down here as a believer is a journey, and you can get to a certain point in your life where you decide, I don't want to go any further. And this is what he is exhorting them about. Don't stay there. That's a dangerous place to be in. And we've seen that throughout the sixth chapter. He has a greater hope for them that they will recognize that and they will go on to maturity. And he's given them the example of Abraham. And sometimes we think the Old Testament doesn't apply to it. What, a, what an example in Abraham. God made a covenant with him. I will give you a land and I will give you a seed and I will make you a blessing to the whole world. And now Abraham, as he journeyed through the promised land, didn't own one piece of it. He and Sarah are beyond the years of having a son. And yet God promised him, I'll give you this land and I'll give you a seed. That would have discouraged a lot of us. And I, over the years I've seen Christians come, to re, those who have accepted Christ, they become Christians, and something happens in their experience in their early years and they drop out. They become discouraged, they just quit. Not Abraham. And that's the example he was giving us for hope. I will bless you. I will multiply you. Abraham persevered until one day God said, your wife is going to have a son at age 90. And it is through this son the Messiah will come. Abraham never owned a piece of land in the promised land. And that will not come to fruition until Jesus comes back but he trusted him. Why could he do that? Because God promised it. And therefore the writer says, therefore because he patiently waited, he attained the promise. God desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his purpose interposed with an oath by two unchangeable things. God swore it and God's word. And because you and I can stand on this word, we can have hope. And a lot of people in this world today have no hope. You ask them, do you know you're going to heaven when you die? I hope so. All they have is a hope so religion. The New Testament is very plain. We have a hope. And that hope is centered in Christ. Paul said in Colossians 1.27, Christ in you the hope of glory. So therefore, because we have that hope based on the word of God and based on the oath of God, we have eternal security. And he gave us this vivid picture and he's about to get into an individual that is sort of confusing in the Bible. So look at verse 19 of chapter 6. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, one that enters within the veil where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us. Having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Wow, what a strange sounding name. Here's, here's what he wants you and me to understand this morning, folks. Because our Lord Jesus became our sin bearer, because he offered himself up to pay the sin debt, a debt he didn't owe, so that you and I would pay, have, not have to pay the debt we did owe, because of his death, burial, and resurrection, and his ascension back into heaven, God has accepted the finished work of the Lord Jesus. And because his work is finished, he sat down at the right hand of God the Father. And this is the picture he's painting in the, the last verses of chapter 6. 
He has entered into the veil. He went into the Holy of Holies. He's the forerunner for all of us. And because of that, I have an anchor, our Lord, and I don't have time to go back through the Old Testament, the high priest never finished his ministry because the blood of animals and goats and lambs could not take away the sin. It could only cover up the sin so that God's judgment would be held back until the true Lamb of God would come and pour out his blood in a sacrifice that God would accept. And therefore, when he went back into the Holy of Holies as the high priest, he didn't have to come back out, do it all over again and all over again and all over again. He hasn't been doing that since the moment he ascended back into heaven. He sat down. His work, a redemptive work, is finished. That doesn't mean Jesus is idle. He's not doing anything. There is a work he's still involved in. But the finished work of redemption is done. And I place my faith and trust in him. Now I am not only in Christ, Christ is in me. Positionally that's where every one of us are this morning that are believers. And when Jesus went back into heaven, the Lord God accepted his finished work and Jesus sat down. He wouldn't have to do that anymore. It was done. And the writer is saying to these immature believers, why do you not have security? Why is it you doubt your salvation? You have a great high priest. He did the finished work that God sent him to do. He has ascended back into heaven. He has sat down at the right hand of God the Father. And that's where your anchor is. And there's nobody that will ever pull that anchor down out of heaven. I am in him and he is in me. That is a living hope. That is a steadfast hope. That is a sure, secure hope. It is the hope that looks forward to the return of the Lord Jesus for his church. The blessed hope that Paul talks about in Titus. We have that hope. And now he begins to move into another phase that these Jewish believers needed to understand. And this is one that some of us do not seem to comprehend. And you begin to study this person called Melchizedek and you find all kinds of weird imaginations, all kinds of opinion about who this is. So look at verse 20 again. Our Lord Jesus entered as a forerunner for us. That's like the scout for an army. He's gone ahead of that army. He is preparing the way. Our Lord has prepared the way so that one day you and I will be in heaven with him forever and forever because he was a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now let me begin reading verse 1 of chapter 7. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham as he was returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham apportioned a ten part, tenth part of all the spoils, was first of all, by translation of his name, king of righteousness, king of Salem, which is king of peace. Wow, this is a strange individual. This little word for in verse 1 refers back to 620 where Paul, uh, the writer of Hebrews tells us Jesus entered within the veil as our forerunner and he did that according to the order of Melchizedek. Now follow me all the way through because I don't want you to get lost. Who in the world is Melchizedek? So the writer identifies him for us. He is king of Salem and priest of the Most High God. 
And then a little further down, he is the king of righteousness and the king of peace. Who in the world is Melchizedek? And why is the writer telling us that Jesus entered into the veil according to the order of Melchizedek? Melchizedek is only mentioned twice in the Old Testament. Let me read those passages for you. In Genesis chapter 14, and I don't have time to go through all of that story. You remember when Lot and Abraham decided they were going to part company because they both were growing so prosperous. And Abraham, being the kind of man that he was, said, Look, Lot, you decide to go to the right or you decide to go to the left. Whichever one you want to go, I'll go the opposite way so there will not be conflict. And Lot lifted up his eyes and looked to the well-watered plains of Sodom and Gomorrah. And that's where he decided he wanted to go. He moved into a den of sin and wickedness and vileness and depravity. Sodom and Gomorrah were inundated with homosexuality. It was vile and abhorrent to God. But that's where Lot decided to go. A lot of us are like that today. We look at the world and we say, well, that grass is green over there. I think that's where I'm going. And never stop to remember what we talked about in Sunday school, Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, and it'll tell you whether or not you're operating in the realm of the soulish or whether you're operating in the realm of the spiritual. Oh, that's where all the money is. That's where the grass is greener. That's where I'm going, and that's exactly where Lot went. And we're told in later on that there wasn't a moment, a day in the life of Lot that he knew peace. He was living as a believer in the midst of depravity and wickedness. That's the context. And then in Genesis chapter 14, Moses records for us in the days of these five kings and then the other four kings decide they're at war with one another. Let me, let me look at verse 14 of Genesis, uh, chapter 14. The kings of Sodom and Gomorrah went out and war against the other alliance and they lost and they were scattered and they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all the food supply and they departed. They swooped in, defeated those in the valley of salt in Sodom and Gomorrah and not only did they defeat them, they took possessions, they took slaves, they took people, they took whatever they could find and according to Moses, they took Lot. Abraham's nephew and his possessions and departed because Lot was living in Sodom. Wow. Let me tell you, folks, when you violate biblical principles and you continue to live there, you're headed for trouble. There will be consequences of your choices. And Lot never had a day of peace down there. And now, all of a sudden, he's been captured he's a prisoner and this is where we come in contact with Melchizedek so in chapter 24 of 14 of Genesis verse 13 a fugitive came and told Abraham the Hebrew what had happened and when Abraham heard that his relative had been taken captive he led out his trained men born in his house 318, and they went in pursuit as far as Dan. He divided his forces against them by night. He and his servants, and they defeated them and pursued them as far as Hobop, which is north of Damascus. And then he brought back all the goods and, all, and also brought back his relative Lot with his possessions and the women and the people. Abraham had a surprise raid on these kings overwhelmed them, defeated them, and rescued Lot. Now he's headed home. 
And all of a sudden, we're introduced to this mysterious individual. Now, please hear what I'm going to say this morning. I want you to go out of here and, and be in one of those fanciful imaginations about who this person is. Here's how he described it. Verse 17. Then after his return from the, of the defeat and the, of the kings that were with him, uh, of, the, of the, the main king, Shedar Leomer, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Sheba. And then somebody else came out to meet him, Melchizedek, king of Salem, who brought out bread and wine, and he was a priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, the possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abraham gave him a tent of all that he possessed. That's the first place Melchizedek is mentioned. The second place is over in Psalm 110. This is a messianic psalm. And listen to what the psalmist records about Melchizedek. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Who is that? The Lord said to my Lord. This is a conversation in the Trinity, folks. This is God the Father talking to God the Son. This is a messianic song. The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion, saying, Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power. In holy array from the womb of the dawn, your, do, your youth are to you as the dew. In verse 4, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Wow. What is this? Who is this person? Why is this even recorded? Again, the only two places Melchizedek is mentioned in the Old Testament. Genesis 14 and Psalm 110. Very brief. And yet, when you come to the letter to the Hebrews, the writer devotes more space than the Old Testament does to Melchizedek. And I don't want to try to, and I don't apologize for stretching your mind and making you think, but Melchizedek is the theological key to understanding the priesthood of Jesus in heaven today. And when you get to chapter 7, the writer is about to tell us the old priesthood, the Levitical priesthood, was far inferior to the new priesthood that resides and is identified in our Lord Jesus, the Melchizedek priesthood. What is that? Why is there a difference? What is he talking about? This word Melchizedek in the Hebrew is an interesting word. It's a compound word. The word Melek in the Hebrew means to rule and reign like a king. To have dominion and authority. The second part of his name, Zedek, means righteous. There was another king of Jerusalem in Joshua chapter 10 who is named Adonai Zedek. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Why is this important for me to know who Melchizedek is? Why is it important theologically? Several reasons. Number one, that's telling you and me tonight, uh, this morning, and I'll just, uh, sometimes again we just piecemeal scripture, we don't put it all together. When I read about Melchizedek, that he was the king of Salem, 
he was the king of peace and righteousness. He was a high priest of the Most High God in Genesis 14. That is telling us that after the flood, when Noah and his family were the only ones who survived, that the true knowledge of God that was possessed by Noah and his son did not die out. They began to pass that on. That's something we don't do today. They passed it on. And now when Abraham is face to face with Melchizedek, he acknowledges him that he is the priest of the Most High God. And he is described as the Most High God, the God that Abraham worshipped. Wow, you know what that's telling me? It's telling you. There is evidence of true worship in Jerusalem long before, long before the Jebusite transferred the title to King David in 2 Kings, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 24. And you trace all that together. When in 2 Samuel 24, and I'm, I may have lost everybody already, the Jebusite or Nan transferred the title to that piece of land to King David. And that piece of land was Mount Moriah, which is the place that Abraham offered up Isaac, which is in Jerusalem. Wow. Goodness. You begin to piece all this together. In Genesis 14, we're introduced very briefly to Melchizedek. Abraham is on the way home after a successful campaign. He's rescued his nephew Lot. And as he's headed back to the house, he encounters Melchizedek. This is 900 years later. To be mentioned. In Psalm 110, it's a thousand years later. And then all of a sudden you jump over to Hebrews and the writer's going to mention him at, at least nine times. So before I tell you who this person is, let me, there are three things about this king of the city of Salem. Salem is another word in the Bible for, can you guess? Jerusalem. You can start to put all the pieces together. The three things that you and I can know about this. Again, his name, Melchizedek, is a compound name. Righteous King. So the first thing I learned is that the city of Salem is the city of Jerusalem. And this city has a king by the name of Melchizedek. He's not only the king, he's a high priest. Secondly, he is the high priest of the Most High God. El Elyon in the Hebrew. This is not some local deity. This is a word that describes the one true solo. Sovereign, holy God that Abraham worshipped. El was the common name for the gods, the deities. And the writers took that word El over into scripture and made it into the name that would describe the one true God, 
in opposition to all the false gods. And then they would add another part of that name. We just finished doing that in prayer meeting. He's wonderful counselor. He's mighty God. He's the everlasting father. He's the prince of peace. And now he is El Elyon. He is the God who is most high. This is the God that Abraham worshipped. Isn't that amazing? This is the God that, Abra that Melchizedek served. The most high God. And then he is the high priest of this God. And this is the first time the word priest occurs in the Bible. If you're even conversant with the Jewish faith and tradition, it's Kohan. Sometimes it's spelled with a C instead of the K. That's the word for priest. Now notice how he describes this most high God. And the reason I'm doing this foundation, folks, so we'll understand the importance of this confrontation with Abraham and Melchizedek, and that the writer of Hebrews is telling us very clearly that Jesus is after the order of Melchizedek in his priesthood. And notice how he describes the most high God. He is the creator of heaven and earth. Which means that our Lord Jesus Christ is the sovereign authority over all of creation. We don't recognize that. And then all of a sudden we're told that Abraham gave a tenth of all that he had to Melchizedek. I get amused at some of these people today over on some form of theology saying, well, Ty, then getting taught in the New Testament. You need to do your homework, folks. This is why we have such a, a, a scarcity of financial resources to carry the gospel. If you were looking at a chronology of the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 14 comes before Exodus. It comes before the law was given. Is that not right? Long before God gave Moses the law on Mount Sinai. This was a common practice even among the pagan cultures, giving a tent. Now, for Abraham to do this, he recognized in this individual that there was something different about him. He was the king of Jerusalem, the king of righteousness, and he is the most high, a priest of the most high God. And so people began to speculate who this is. Some will say... <laughs> This is the pre-incarnate Christ. This is an appearance in the Old Testament. Let me see if I can negate that for you. And I say this all the time, and I may, may have probably ought to shut down because I've left everybody clear as mud. The writer of Hebrews tells us that Melchizedek was like. Not that he was, he is like the Son of God. And that's always an indicator that he's talking about something that is not the real thing. It is something else. And somebody will say, but look at his name. King of righteousness and priest of the Most High God. You could make the same argument in Joshua 10.1 for 
Adonai Zadak, who was the king also of Jerusalem. And that's a compound name, righteousness, and Adonai is the word Lord. He was the Lord of righteousness. He certainly was not the pre-incarnate Christ. Melchizedek is not the, the uh, pre-incarnate Christ. The word that he uses, he write, the writer of Hebrews uses here, is a word that simply means to make something like. He doesn't use the word character. He doesn't use the word image. He is like the Son of God. Now follow this all the way through. If he's like the Son of God, he has to be a type of something. He's not the Son of God, but he is like the Son of God. Thirdly, part of the requirement for being a priest, the Levitical priest, he had to be a man. Now think this through. Well, didn't Jesus become the God-man? Folks, when did he become the God-man? When he was born? When he became incarnate. Jesus wasn't a man in eternity. He became a man at his birth or when he entered into the, the, the uh, fetus of Mary. But Melchizedek is a man. And this is Genesis chapter 14. Wow. I guess I've lost everybody. <laughs> and in Psalm 110, verse 4, David is very specific. Yahweh, God, appointed Messiah as a priest after the order of Melchizedek. When did that occur? When our Lord Jesus ascended back into heaven and God accepted his finished work and he sat down at the right hand of God the Father. So Melchizedek, this is not a pre-incarnate Christ. There's, some, there's all kinds of fanciful ideas about who this was. Some say this was sham. He just lived to an old age and he's still functioning. Or this was some kind of high angel that revealed himself. No, that's not it at all. He is after the order of Melchizedek. Now why is this important for us to understand? Because the reader, the writer is trying to impress upon these immature believers that you have a Messiah who has come and you're threatening to walk away from this Messiah and go back under the tradition and religions of Judaism. You need to understand that our Lord Jesus Christ that you have accepted and present, uh, professed is far greater than the, the Levitical priesthood you want to go back up under. Far greater than that. You need to understand what he is saying, and he is simply nailing this down for them. Now, I'm not going to take the time. You can go back to uh, Exodus and Numbers when God established the Levitical priesthood. Follow this very carefully. The priesthood resided in the tribe of Levi and Aaron. The first high priest for the nation of Israel was Aaron. Let me see if we're without being confusing. Every Levite, every priest was a Levite. But not every Levite could be the high priest. Does that make sense? That only came through the line of Aaron. So the other Levites were associate pastors are musicians, or ministers of education. They were assistants. 
the high priest could only come through Aaron. And all the priests that served around Aaron would be from the tribe of Levi. I, 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 I can't tell by looking at your faces where I believe. <laughs> and so you work your way down through the Old Testament and you see about this priesthood, the Levitical priesthood. They were chosen and appointed by God. Now listen very carefully. They were not the ruling class in Israel. In fact, God makes it very plain that a Levite could never be king. And the king was never to assume and take over the responsibility of being a priest. The Levites were set aside as first fruits to God for their priestly ministry service. And you'll remember that's why Uzziah died because he decided as king of Israel he was going to go into the temple and take over the duties of the priest and God struck him with leprosy. The two never would mix, the king and the priest. They could not reside in one person. Is that clear up to this point? So that means that if Jesus is, go is king and he's going to be the high priest, he cannot come from the line of Levi. That's pretty obvious. And so now the writer, as is Moses and David in the Old Testament, telling us Jesus is after the order of Melchizedek. His is a far superior priesthood. Wow. Wouldn't you like to be taking this in the class and having a test on it? Wow. It's really not that hard to follow. When you recognize what God established in Israel and the priestly line came from Aaron and the associate priest came from, the, well, they're all from Levi. For instance, in the parable of the Good Samaritan, the Samaritan went by, the Samaritan was lying in the road, uh, the the Jew was lying in the road, beaten, robbed. And a Levite came by, passed him. And then he said, the priest came by. Huh? And they both passed him. But a Samaritan came and took care of him. You see that division. Not every priest could be the high priest. Only those that came through the line of Aaron. But the rest of them were all assistants. They served in some capacity in the temple. But a priest could never be a king. Never. The priesthood was a national thing. It was hereditary. The priests never lived forever. When they retired, they retired at a certain age, and then eventually they died. But then I began to look at uh, Melchizedek, and I began to realize why the writer is saying this is far superior to Aaron. The Melchizedek priesthood was universal. It wasn't natural. It wasn't heredity. He was a priest of the Most High God. And that is the name that represents the possessor of heaven and earth, Jew and Gentile alike. Aaron and the other priests served Yahweh and Yahweh alone, but it was a national service. It was within the nation of Israel And then we began to realize Jesus is not just the Messiah of Israel. He's the Messiah of the whole world. 
And that's why Melchizedek is far superior to that. He was also the king. Four times in verses 1 through 2, he's referred to as a king. And the Levites could never, ever be king. All of this was separated in the nation of Israel. He is righteous and peaceful. There's no permanent righteousness and peace related to Aaron or the priest. This is not a hereditary position. I'm going to run out of time. Let me, let me tell you what this is and I'll explain to you. Melchizedek is not the pre-incarnate Christ. He's not some superior angel. And I, don't, I haven't got time to get to where he says he has no mother, no father. I'll explain that to you next week. Melchizedek is a type of Christ. A type of Christ. Now, if you take hermeneutics, you learn what a type is, how to recognize that in the Bible, and how to find the fulfillment of it in the New Testament. He is a type of Christ. He's not the Christ, but he's a type of it. That's where he, why he said he is made like unto the Son of God. Wow. And the reason he is doing this for them is so they'll understand. You have put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus. He's far superior to the Aaronic priesthood. He is off the, after the order of Melchizedek, king and priest. I don't, and I'm not trying to be redundant here, folks, but if you just give yourself to the leadership of the Holy Spirit, reading the Bible, digesting it, studying it will become an exciting thing for you. And I have thought about this this morning. I grew up in a First Baptist church. I grew up in a home where my mother was the, the dedicated, committed Christian. I had a Bible. They had, by, I've got some of my mother's Bibles in, at home now. I was looking through them the other day. And my mother usually had recorded date and all when I was preaching. But I never opened that Bible growing up other than taking it to church on Sunday because I never was discipled. Never, no one ever taught me the, the importance of the Word of God in my life. But when the Spirit is controlling us, there is a desire and a hunger and a thirst to know more and more and more. And then you begin to put all that together. And you realize that there's 66 books in the Bible, but there's only one theme. Forty different people wrote the Bible over a period of 14, 1,500 years, and yet there's just one theme throughout all of the Bible, and that's the redeeming blood of the Lord Jesus, the Messiah. This is what the writer wants them to understand. I don't have to close this morning. If you're here and you've never put your faith and trust in this Messiah who finished the work God sent him to do, you can have that hope, that assurance, that certainty. That anchor is in heaven and nobody will ever pull that anchor out from there. You're in Christ and he's at the right hand of God the Father. Or maybe you're watching online and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I his invitation to you today is now. I invite you to pray this prayer with me. Dear God, I confess to you that I'm a sinner. I repent of my sins. I ask you to forgive me. I invite Jesus Christ into my life. I accept him. I receive him as my Lord and my Savior. Michael's going to lead us in this hymn of commitment. Maybe the Spirit's talking to you in, here in the auditorium this morning. Maybe your, your life is not one of a disciplined daily meditation time in the Word. Starting this Wednesday night, I'm going to begin a series on very simply how God makes you like Jesus. It's not the fact that you are indwelled by Jesus. There's more and more and more to that. 
how does he conform us to the image of his son? As Michael leads us, would you come? Number 434, we're going to sing the first and the last verse. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back, no turning back. Well, we'll continue our study from the Revelation tonight. Pray for Awana this Wednesday. What, what is the theme this week? Jump for Jesus. Okay. Jump. Jump for Jesus. Oh, jump for Jesus. I don't. I don't want to ask what that entails. I'm, I'm at a point where I, I can't jump very. Just be praying for Awana this Wednesday night, and then share Jesus this week with somebody. Thank you, Father, for your Word for the living word, Jesus, the written word, Scripture. We ask your Holy Spirit to impress upon us that this is our only source of spiritual food. And if we're not partaking of it, if we're not digesting it, then we're not growing. Give us the boldness to share the Lord Jesus this week. In the strong name of Christ, we pray. Amen.